Hello, and welcome to an inf information session on the Reproductive Freedom Act in New Jersey. My name is Jennifer Ruggiero, and I serve as the Director for the Office of Human Life and Dignity for the Diocese of Metuchen. Good morning, my name is Good morning, my name is James King, and I serve as the Executive Director for the New Jersey Catholic Conference. So today we'll be discussing the New Jersey Reproductive Freedom Act, which is S3030 and A4848. But let us begin with an opening prayer. And this prayer is from the USCCB Walking with Moms in Need Initiative. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. O oh, Blessed Mother, you received the good news of the incarnation of Christ, your Son, with faith and trust. Grant your protection to all pregnant mothers facing difficulties. Guide us as we strive to make our parish communities places of welcome and assistance for mothers in need. Help us become instruments of God's love and compassion. Mary, Mother of the Church, graciously help us build a culture of life and a civilization of love together with all people of goodwill, to the praise and glory of God, the creator and lover of life. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So on October 2nd, uh, Governor Murphy announced his support for legislation that was going to be introduced in the coming days uh, called the New Jersey Reproductive Freedom Act. Those bill numbers are S3030, A4848. According to the governor, the bill is a proactive piece of legislation to protect and expand New Jerseyans' ability to receive reproductive care, including contraception and abortion. Uh, this was done you know, in part in wake to the passing of Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. If passed, the Reproductive Freedom Act would uh, codify into law the findings of Roe v. Wade, uh, meaning that abortion would remain legal in New Jersey, even if the case were overturned by the Supreme Court. New Jersey's bishops immediately issued a statement uh, voicing their so strong opposition to this bill. And that statement is available on the New Jersey Catholic Conference website as shown on our slide. Correct. So just a little background, uh, as most everyone knows, back in January of 1973, the Supreme Court of the United States gave our nation Roe v. Wade and its companion piece, Doe v. Bolton, and in doing so effectively removed every legal protection from hum human beings prior to birth. So what has this done? Over the past 47 years, we've seen a lot of impact. Millions of innocent lives have been destroyed before birth in abortion. Countless women have been traumatized so deeply by abortion that they spend years struggling to find peace, healing, and reconciliation. Not only physical scars, but emotional scars, spiritual scars happen and have been reported. Men also agree because they could not choose to protect a child they helped bring into existence. And we all know that a man has no choice if a woman decides to abort her baby. Um, they have no rights to that baby, even if, the, even if they're married, a married couple. And society has increasingly coarsened by toleration and acceptance of acts that purposely destroy human life. We recently saw this in New Jersey about a year or so ago with the legalization of physician-assisted suicide, another attack on human life. So in New Jersey, as uh, many individual states have passed laws to regulate or limit abortion, sadly, New Jersey remains one of the few states without any major restrictions on abortion, such as mandatory consent for minors, parental notification, waiting periods, or limits on publicly funded abortion. We have one of the most permissive laws on abortion in the land. And according to Alan Guttenmacher Institute, in, 19, in, sorry, in 2017, there were reported over 48,000 abortions performed in our state. And in 2020, it was largely publicized when New Jersey allocated $9.5 million of taxpayer money to Planned Parenthood, the leading abortion provider. So Jennifer, I'm gonna take over now and go through what the bill would do if it was signed into law. Uh, we're going to divide this up by various sections. So first, you know, how would this impact uh, the health and safety of women in the state? Well, 
First, the RFA avoids all life protecting rules and regulations with regards to abortion as promulgated by the New Jersey Board of Medical Examiners. It allows non-physicians, including but not limited to a certified midwife, advanced practice nurse, or physician assistant to perform an abortion procedure in a non-hospital setting. The Reproductive Freedom Act also allows for abortions throughout all nine months of pregnancy. The risk of complications from, the, from abortion rises exponentially the later in pregnancy the procedure is performed. Each of these factors clearly present uh, puts the safety of women at risk. Now, who are the victims? The RFA also applies to non-New Jersey residents. Since abortion and sex trafficking are undeniably linked, New Jersey could become a magnet for traffickers if the RFA becomes law. So essentially what the bill says is it does not matter if you're a resident of New Jersey, you are afforded not only the right to an abortion, but you're also afforded the right to have taxpayer funded abortions. So the state would allocate funding to provide these services for any individual, regardless of residency uh, here in the state. Additionally, the RFA states very clearly that under this law, it is established that a fertilized egg, the embryo, or the fetus, at all terms for early human life or children in the womb, does not have independent rights. If passed, the Reproductive Freedom Act would enshrine into law that living babies in the womb, even if viable, have no rights. Healthcare workers, this is of major concern. The RFA eliminates New Jersey's longstanding con conscience protection clause, which protects the rights of healthcare workers to refuse to perform or assist in abortion because doing so would violate either their ethical or religious beliefs. Uh, in addition, the uh, Reproductive Freedom Act would require that the state legislature allocate funding for abortion services and contraceptives in the annual state budget. And finally, newborns. The RFA would eliminate the requirement for an autopsy to be conducted in the case where a fetal death occurs without medical attendance. This strips away the rights of a newborn baby alive and clearly opens the doors to infanticide. And you know, I just want to mention, I think we, you know, uh, it's most recent, there was a case up in New York City where uh, twin newborns were found, uh, uh, obviously, uh, dead in the basement of the, an apartment building. And it was clear that by the reports that these newborns were, uh, uh, they died at birth and they were just left in that. So a situation like that, if this bill were to pass here in New Jersey, there would be no uh, legal investigation, no criminal investigation. It would just be treated as, uh, well, this was the will of the, the mother at the time. So that's obviously very concerning for us. Jim, I have a question. Um, you know, I mentioned earlier that New Jersey has one of the most uh, permissive laws in our country with regards to abortion. Um, this obviously is expanding, uh, expanding things quite a bit, but why, since we have one of the most permissive laws, doesn't it, you know, pose the question, why do we, why do we need this bill now? Sure, yes, I, I think that's a great question, Jennifer, and I, I think that's a question many uh, uh, of us have as to what is the necessity of this bill? Um, you know, my understanding of Roe v. Wade at the federal level is even if it were to be overturned, it would have no impact on uh, New Jersey's current abortion laws. The state could continue to, uh, unfortunately, provide access to abortion. So uh, that does raise the question as to what is the necessity of this bill at this time? Uh, you know, there, there, there's a number of reasons that we speculate on, you know, how does it relate to the confirmation of uh, Justice Amy Comey Barrett. Uh, how does it relate to? How did it relate to the presidential election uh, that just occurred? So again, that's a that's a great question, and that's a question that we are posing to our legislators right now. What is the necessity of this bill? And hopefully, we'll find out what their reasons are and be able to argue against those reasons as this bill proceeds through the legislature, if and when it does proceed through the legislature. Now, and, and, and related to that point, Jennifer, I think that you know, it, it, we have to point out that this law, or this bill, I'm sorry, would uh, prohibit the future enactment of any, or I'm sorry, it goes so far as to invalidate and prohibit the future adoption of all laws, rules, and regulations, ordinances, resolutions, policies that conflict with the provisions 
or the express or implied intent of the Reproductive Freedom Act. So, for example, you have to ask, what does this do to the New Jersey safe haven law, where mothers can drop their babies off at police stations, hospitals, fire firehouses, without question? You know, what impact does that have? Uh, you know, given the efforts we've made to expand awareness of that, uh, th that that uh, that assistance for mothers at this time. Uh, I know one thing that we've worked on uh, for the number uh, for the past couple of years is the 2020 project, uh, banning uh, legislate uh, banning partial birth abortions after 20 or any abortion after 20 weeks uh, uh, viability. So, uh, you know, we can see how far reaching this bill is trying to go in terms of uh, codifying uh, abortion in, in the state of New Jersey. Do we think that that's even constitutional? Uh, at this time, based on the legal ex legal experts I have spoken to, uh, we do not believe it is constitutional. Uh, I know there's been other attempts in separate issues where uh, people have tried to, uh, I guess, tie the hands of future le legislatures, uh, future elected officials from passing laws, and it, it does not seem like it passes the muster test on, in terms of being allowed. So obviously, I think that would be something that would be called into question if and when this bill does uh, move through the legislature. Thank you. So Jim, maybe you could just explain a little bit about the legislative process. Uh, so we kind of have a sense of where this bill is now and, and uh, you know, how it's going to move. Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, you know, obviously, this is a very uh, concerning issue for all of us. I think it's a very emotional issue. Um, for each of us, I know for myself personally, and if I can just deviate for a few minutes on this, uh, you know, whenever it comes to uh, an abortion bill, uh, I think back to my uh, my mother uh, who instilled in me my uh, care for the unborn. Uh, she had uh, two miscarriages prior to uh, becoming pregnant with me, and even at the time of that pregnancy, or my, the doctor told my mom not to get her hopes up that based on her uh, medical history, uh, there wasn't a high probability that I would, uh, this pregnancy would go to term. So my mother actually being the devout Catholic she is, uh, prayed to St. Jude, uh, patron of uh, you know, uh, lost causes or desperate causes. And uh, you know, I was born and that's how I got my middle name, St. Jude. Obviously, as I went through life, my mom would joke that you know, she prayed to St. Jude for other reasons now for my, for my life. But uh, you know, so seeing that struggle, my mother, or sharing that struggle, my mother always said she could not understand how people who could have fully healthy babies and have uh, viable pregnancies could uh, disregard life uh, so quickly and without a care in the world, given the fact that she struggled so much just to have one child. So, uh, you know, you understand the emotional aspect of uh, of this bill. And I know we all want to immediately get out there and stop this bill. But we have to understand it's going to go through a process and that process is more of a marathon than a sprint. You know, right now there we're hearing there's very little uh, conversation about this bill. Uh, most likely will not move uh, in the next few months. Uh, we have to remain vigilant. I mean, information can, can change at any time. But once the bill starts to move, this is pretty much the process that we'll go through. So we've already gone through steps one and two. The idea was, it was developed and the bill was drafted. So on the New Jersey Catholic Conference website, people can read the text of the bill. Uh, we have links to it right there at our, uh, on our website. But the bill has been introduced, so we've gone through steps one, two, and three. And it has been referenced to committee. So currently both bills sit in the health committees for the General Assembly and the Senate, the State Senate. So committee action would be the next step. So that's what we're waiting for right now. When would the committee post this bill for a hearing? And then at that time, you know, uh, both opponents and supporters of the bill would come out and deliver their testimony. That's the most appropriate time for uh, unified action to contact legislators uh, prior to that, asking the committee members to oppose or vote no on the bill and asking other legislators to uh, urge their colleagues to vote no. So we're waiting for committee action. If and when uh, the bill uh, is released from committee, um, it will go through what they call a second reading. That's more of a technical uh, uh, procedural term. Uh, so we're not going to get too much into that. It'll go into a third reading. And then it'll eventually 
go into what they call a, a house vote, a floor vote. So that'll come before the floor at a session and the both the General Assembly and the Senate would vote on the bills. Uh, there could be a number of procedural issues that come up at time uh, throughout this uh, process. Uh, you know, I would like to reference right now one of the hot hot issues, one of the most publicized issues is the uh, cannabis regulation. And you can see how long this process can take. Uh, you know, can the, the, the constitutional amendment passed with overwhelming public support back on November 3rd. I think it was somewhere around 65, 66% of the uh, voting public uh, supported that measure. Uh, but currently the legislature is going through uh, prolonged debates on how to actually implement that law and how to construct that that law. Uh, so, you know, obviously, just because something may have public support doesn't mean it's going to be a slam dunk in the legislative process. So once you get before you even get to the House vote, there could be changes to the both the assembly version, the Senate version, they're going to have to talk about do they agree on these changes? Do they what do they do with the bill? So again, I just want to reiterate, this is a marathon. It's not a sprint uh, at this time. You know, so we at the Catholic Conference are uh, monitoring the legislation. We are in constant contact with uh, uh, people we know over at the state house and in the legislature, keeping tabs on what the you know what the prospects of this bill are, and you know you know we will release updates as they become available. So finally, if it were to go to a House vote, it has to pass a simple majority. So in the Senate, it would require uh, 21 votes. There's 40 state senators, and then in the uh, assembly, it's 41 votes because there are 80 uh, assembly members, so two per legislative district. Uh, if it passes, then it would go to the governor's desk, at which point the governor has the ability to outright veto the bill, conditionally to veto the bill, which means he makes his own changes to the legislation or sign it as is. And if he were to either veto or conditionally veto, it would go back to the legislature and they would either have to accept his changes or attempt to uh, override that on another vote. And I believe both houses would have to come to a two thirds majority to override either a conditional veto or an outright veto of the bill. And then, then it would become law. So during each of these steps, there'll be opportunities for us to, as a Catholic community, uh, have our voices heard at the appropriate time. So right now it's important for people to educate themselves on the bill, raise awareness, be aware of this uh, legislation, know what's in the bill, know what it could potentially do and the harm it could potentially cause if it were signed into law. So that is what we're looking at in terms of the legislative process and how a bill becomes a law. Thank you, Jim. I think it's really helpful for people to understand that it is a marathon. I to your point about that, I remember with um, the assisted suicide legislation, we fought that for eight years. It was a long haul. And, um, you know, we had to mobilize people at various times, various points during that process. I think that when um, New York City, New York State uh, just passed a, the similar law, I think it was the Reproductive Health, Health Act, um, back in January of 2019, it was signed into law. It took them 12 years. So it yes. is a marathon. And I think it's important. The timing of things is very important. Right. And, and, and you're exactly right, Jennifer. I mean, obviously, we're not telling people to become complacent and think that this, you know, uh, won't happen. Uh, it's just we have to be prepared for an extended period of advocacy on this. And, you know, it, right now it's not well, in any case with the legislature, a bill doesn't just automatically get introduced and become law. It has to go through these steps. Obviously, there's some bills that it's easier to pass. Uh, through the legislature, and then there's others that are more complicated, as we've seen. Um, you know, just to give people context, you know, in every legislative session, which is a good, which occurs over a two-year period. So, right now we're coming to the halfway point of the current legislative session. The next session will begin in the in January of 2022, after we have our state elections in the fall of 2021. Uh, at that point, bills will have to be reintroduced if there's no action taken on them, and the whole process will start over again. So here we are at the halfway point going through this current legislative session. And if, you know, uh, you know, if nothing happens on this bill, it would have to be reintroduced and then go start from square one all over again. And, and again, just to give people context right now, halfway point of the current legislative session, there's close to 8,600 bills that have already been introduced in the legislature. And a, a good majority of them won't see the light of day. Um, you know, I, 
I always share with people uh, something I've learned early on in my legislative uh, work that there's uh, three categories of bills, uh, bills for show, bills for no, and bills for go. Uh, bills for show are obviously a bill that somebody introduces to say, hey, look, I'm, I'm working on this issue, I'm concerned, and you know, there's really no prospect of that bill moving forward. Um, a bill for no is something that's introduced maybe to put uh, individuals into a corner and make it, you know, give them a difficult decision to make that could be used at a later date in terms of uh, other actions and activities and, and, and bills for go. Those are the bills that, you know, will become law and that, you know, really won't have the trouble. So I'm not going to put this Reproductive Freedom Act in any of those categories right now because, uh, you know, I think the reality is we live in a state with permissive abortion laws. Um, obviously, I think there's concern about the uh, direction of the United States Supreme Court. But I just want people to, you know, understand the, the bigger picture here of what we're dealing with and how this process will go about uh, at this time. Great. Thank you so much. So that brings us to what you can do. And I know um, I've been getting some calls and emails. Uh, what is the church doing? What are the bishops doing? Um, we're doing a lot. We're putting together a deliberate plan. Uh, one of the unique things that our organization as a church, um, our USCCB Pro-Life Secretariat, has us working in four distinct areas, education, advocacy, prayer, and outreach. So these are the four areas that you can be involved in now. Um, education, as Jim pointed out, now is a time to really educate yourself and your and your friends and your neighbors about this bill, what it's all about. Um, we're going to have this webinar available for you to, to uh, show to others in your parishes. Um, we're going to have a ton of resources on the New Jersey Catholic Conference website, which is listed here. And, um, you know, it's a really good time to really just kind of feel comfortable with the knowledge that you have about this legislation so that you don't say things that are put out misinformation and that's very important advocacy as jim talked about it takes a long time for a bill to become a law um, you are certainly encouraged to contact your state legislators and urge them to oppose this legislation both in the senate and the assembly uh, we do have a listing of uh, how to find your legislators and some talking points on the new jersey catholic conference website so we encourage you to do that uh, we will issue an action alert when the time is right uh, prayer, pray and fast for into abortion. Um, that's something, prayer obviously is the foundation of all that we do. Um, we encourage you to attend the uh, Respect Life prayer events in January. There'll be a novena for life in January. And, and there may be other statewide prayer initiatives um, to be announced in the future. We're, we're working on all of that behind the scenes. Uh, outreach, finally outreach. You know, this is so important because a lot of people that uh, consider themselves pro-choice will will criticize the pro-life movement for only caring about the babies in the womb. All you care about is the babies. Well, so that's certainly not the case. Um, we have an initiative called Walking with Moms in Need that was introduced last March uh, to the whole country and asking parishes to inventory uh, the, the resources that we have for pregnant moms in need and to make people more aware of those resources and where there's resources that are lacking, I try to um, you know, put some of those resources in place. So all of the dioceses across the state have been working on this initiative since March. Obviously, we've been a little stifled because of the pandemic. But this is a time when we really should ramp up our efforts to support and assist our local pregnancy centers and our other agencies that assist pregnant women in need. Um, a lot of them have been stifled as well because of the pandemic. Some of them have had to close for a period of time. But certainly their fundraising efforts have been stifled as well. So this is a time when parishes can, you know, try to do a little bit more, whether it be helping with fundraising, whether it be providing material needs, uh, whether it be just stepping up our prayer efforts to support these women and men that work so hard in the trenches to uh, assist women in need. Um, and the website here, walkingwithmomsinneeds.com, will give you a whole lot more of information. You can actually commit to praying uh, daily prayer, um, and all kinds of other resources are, are available there. So again, these are things that we can do on an ongoing basis. Um, for, we have a four-tiered approach. And, um, you know, if, we, if we're not, you know, doing an action alert right now, we can certainly do all these other things and be making a huge difference in this, um, in this area. Jennifer, if I may, can I just add one other thing? You know, if someone goes to uh, 
the New Jersey Catholic Conference website, uh, I'd encourage them to uh, sign up for our network. Yes. And that's how they'll receive the updates as to when we are going to uh, put our full uh, uh, action alert out there when we're going to mobilize. And they'll, you know, they'll keep up to date on when the bill is actually moving. Uh, so, but I, I completely agree with you. I think, you know, focusing on education, prayer, and outreach at this time are the appropriate steps. Uh, and everything you said about the impact of the pandemic is true. I know at my parish, as a member of our Knights of Columbus, we took a, 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 a particular, we actually took a, a very intended approach to uh, set aside a couple of Sundays over the past few months just to raise donations for our local pregnancy crisis centers because they are hurting at this time for diapers, formulas, other materials. and. Uh, you know, the, the response we got was overwhelming. Uh, we, you know, I think several of these Sundays we had to make several, you know, we took several carloads of materials over to these centers. And, uh, you know, it was interesting. One, one person actually said to me as she, as she was dropping off the, uh, the, the material, she said, oh, I just thought the Knights were only concerned about praying for the unborn because we were talking about our rosaries and praying outside of abortion clinics. She goes, I'm so happy to see that you're taking action to help mothers after the child is born. And so, uh, yeah, we may, yeah, and I think that's important. You know, we may think everybody knows we do this stuff, even with the walking with moms in need. You know, this isn't a new initiative in terms of the church saying, oh, we have to help the, um, the mothers once the child is born. We've been doing this for centuries. And uh, this just is trying to shed more light on that and bring more awareness to that. So I think, I think that, that that's an extremely critical uh, a component at this time is that that ongoing outreach, that ongoing service to uh, mothers and their children. Absolutely. And I want to uh, just bring up a point, uh, the New Jersey Catholic Conference uh, website that we have shown here. We're going to try to make that like a clearinghouse of resources. Um, not only will this webinar be available on that website, but the bishop statements, um, any kind of uh, extra steps that we're taking. We'll have uh, information about walking with moms in need, as well as a listing as, as comprehensive as we can across the state of the pregnancy aid centers that uh, people can uh, assist. One of the things that we're talking about doing in our diocese is during the um, Advent season and during the month of January is having our Catholic high schools each adopt one of these pregnancy centers. And whether they do a prayer service or collect baby bottles filled with money or, or do a diaper drive, we're asking them to do something special um, and adopt one of these centers just to really ramp up the support. So there's all kinds of ways we can be involved and draw attention to uh, you know, the good work that's happening already and, and maybe find out where we need to do more. Uh, this uh, is interesting. It's called Walking with Moms in Need. And one of the first things that we, we came up with was what about the dads? Where are the dads? What resources can we give the dads? because so often the dads are missing in action. So um, that's a place where we wanna kind of look a little bit closer and see what resources are needed. So uh, again, these are, these are four areas you can take action. And um, you know, if you have any questions or, or need more resources, please go to the New Jersey Catholic Conference website for more. Can I add one other thing that it just, I just thought of this as you were talking, Jennifer, you know, we're talking about the, uh, the importance of doing the outreach because it shows us as being concerned for the mother and the child after uh, after birth. But uh, I think what it also does, and sometimes we overlook this point, is that it gives hope to mothers who may be facing a, 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 a crisis pregnancy, that they're not alone. You know, I, I've often said in meetings with legislators and their staff on this issue, you know, why is it, why is it considered a choice when a mother who's living in poverty uh, who can't make basic needs feels the only option she has is to end the life of the child in the womb. I mean, that to me, that's not that's not a choice. You know, that's being forced because of your circumstances. And I think, as a Catholic community, we obviously have the resources, we have the talent, and we have the passion and care from our faithful to uh, show mothers that that's not their choice. They don't. They're not walking alone. That they, this is not you know, uh, a desperate situation that there's a whole community here to support them, to love them, and to journey with them. I mean, really that whole accompaniment, that ministry of accompaniment comes alive. So yes, you know, it's important for us to show that we care beyond the nine months, but I think more importantly, it gets the message out there to these mothers that you're not alone. 
you, you know, this isn't your only option. There are, there's a whole community waiting to walk with you and lift you up and help you and your child, not just through nine months, but through uh, you know, the, the, the child's journey. So I think, and your journey of parenthood. So I think that's a great point. That is a great point. And thanks for bringing that up. I think it's a great segue to our next slide. Um, I think that sometimes um, the stories that we hear, the stories that we hear from the pregnancy help centers, um, you know, they can cause a conversion of your heart because you listen to someone's experience when they're being helped and they, they're given hope. Um, you know, those are the stories we need to highlight during this time because we do have so many, as you said, so many communities that are available and, and willing and, and really wanting to help these young women that are facing either crisis or unplanned pregnancies. Um, our, next, our next piece is actually a, a witness story, um, an excerpt from a talk given by Cheryl Riley. Cheryl serves as the director of the Archdiocese of Newark's Respect Life Office, and I've known her for a number of years. She's a wonderful, wonderful woman. Uh, she did have an abortion experience as a young woman, and in her witness talk, which she gave at a parish back in October during Respect Life Month, she talks about how that experience impacted her life in such terrible ways for about 12 years. Um, you know, all kinds of things happened, and um, that choice really impacted her life in a bad way. Uh, thankfully, she found hope and healing, and we always want to point people to where you can find that help, which is the website uh, listed on this slide. But we're going to show you now an excerpt of Cheryl's testimony. Um, it's a little bit long, so we are only pulling out an excerpt. But um, you can find her entire talk on the New Jersey Catholic Conference website if you'd like to watch it. So here's Cheryl Riley and her witness. Fun, life was good, but when he picked me up the morning of my abortion, I couldn't even look at him. I held the directions in my hand, and I just stared straight ahead in the car. And when we got to the clinic, there was a diner over to the side, and I remember him saying to me, I'll go in and have breakfast while you're in there. And I said, okay. Again, I was going to have this abortion. I was going to put this uh, put this aside and get on with my life, and him and I would end up getting married, have lots more kids, and live, live in a house with a white picket fence one day. That was so far from what happened. I wanted to please him, I wanted to be with him, and I could not stand up for my own child's life. And when I got to the clinic that day, something came over me, and I froze. And I remember saying to him, I cannot do this. But he gave me that little nudge and said, yes, you can. And once I was inside that clinic, it was people were nice. The woman called me up, called my name. And the first thing she asked me for was the money. There was no talking to me what would happen, how I would feel. Are you sure you want to do this? How are you getting home? Nothing. But I wanted someone to talk to me. I wanted someone to tell me what was gonna happen. I sat down with my boyfriend, they called my name, they told me to go in a room. And I remember sitting in a room in a circle with other women. And I was judging them because I said, oh see, these are the ones that the church is talking about. These are the girls that are in here, two abortions, three abortions. I'm better than them because I'm gonna have this abortion and I'll never do this again. I was sitting right next to them, but I was judging them. Women do not use abortion as a form of birth control. They do not. I, it, it is reenactment trauma that these girls go through. They get pregnant, they abort, they find themselves pregnant, this time it's going to be different, this time my boyfriend will marry me, this time my husband won't leave me, and then they find themselves pregnant and they're back in the abortion clinic over and over. They're not using it as a form of birth control. It's a trauma. Abortion is a trauma. And we cannot go through an abortion experience and go back in society and be okay. It doesn't work. They called me in that room. They asked me what kind of anesthesia I wanted, general or local. I said, I have no idea what that means. They said, well, do you want to be awake or you want to be asleep? 
I said, I want to be asleep. The nurse called me in the room. She said, you're about eight weeks pregnant. And I said, okay. And that was all she said to me. I went back in the room, changed, put on a hospital gown. When it was my turn, they called me in the room. I laid down on the bed or the table and I put my legs in stirrups. And I laid there exposing myself to three people in that room that didn't even care to know my name, the doctor, the nurse, and the anesthesiologist. Not one of them said to me, how are you? What's your name? Nothing. All I was to them was a big dollar sign. That's all they cared about because they had to get me in and out because that waiting room was filled with girls. And when I woke up from that abortion, I was crying, I was bleeding. Every single cell in my body was hurting. I went to the bathroom, I passed out. They put me in bed and gave me juice and cookies as my aftercare, the same as you get when you give blood. And they told me I'd be okay in a few days. I suffered for 12 years before I was okay. They gave me an antibiotic and they told me to take it and thank God I did because we hear so many times of women that cannot have children after their abortion. Infection sets in, they don't even know and then years later they can't um, conceive. So I thank God that I, I was able to get that antibiotic because I don't know what would have happened. When I left the clinic that day, my boyfriend and I immediately, our relationship changed. And every cell in me hated, it was filled with hate. I was angry, I was hateful, I, I was angry at the doctors, the nurses, I was angry at my parents for never speaking to me, I was angry at my CCD teachers, I was angry at um, the priest, because why wasn't anybody talking about this from the pulpit? And most of all, I was angry at God because how could he let this happen to me? Where was he? So I pushed God way out of my life, way out. And for the next 12 years, I lived on my own self-will. I turned to drinking, I turned to drugs. I didn't care about myself. I was suicidal. I had no self-esteem. I was put in situations. I could have been raped, I could have been murdered. I didn't care about myself. Every time I wanted to forget about the abortion, I'd stuff it down, but it would pop up like a beach ball in a pool. I would stuff it down, but something would trigger it and it would come up. Not long after my abortion, I was in bed depressed and my mom was down the shore at their shore house and called me and said, are you okay? What's going on? And I said, no, I, I don't feel good. And she said, are you pregnant? And I said, no, mom, I was. And she knew, she knew something was wrong with me. She knew because the strongest bond is between a mother and a child. And she knew something was wrong with one of her children. And I asked her to please not say anything to my father and to keep that secret. I didn't want anyone to know. She really didn't know what to do for me and she really didn't know how to help me. I was showing all symptoms after my abortion and my mom just kept saying to me, you know, pray. And at one point she did say, maybe you should go talk to a therapist. And I did. And that started the next cycle of going to therapy. Every time I brought up the abortion, they didn't want to hear it. It's not the abortion, it's, it's you live in a dysfunctional house, you, you didn't get enough um, hugs and kisses, you didn't get enough time in the bathroom, you didn't get this, you didn't get that. No one would ever let me talk about the abortion. My boyfriend and I, our relationship was toxic, toxic. We broke up, we get back, we broke up, we went back. He was physically abusive, verbally abusive. I stayed with him, I wanted him because I wanted my baby back and he was the connection to my baby. I didn't know this at the time, but I look back, I was so addicted to him and anything he, any crumb he threw me, I took. 
I tried to go out with other guys. I tried to be a good sister, a good friend, a good daughter, and I couldn't. That abortion was just eating me up. But I also thought, what is wrong with me? How many women go through this and they're okay? What is wrong with me? So I was just on this merry-go-round going around and around. A Couple of years after my abortion, I got a job. And this was in the World Trade Center, which was a great place to work at the time. Um, it was a nice job and I remember starting there and this, my supervisor, I recognized her last name. And I thought, oh, I know a girl with that last name. I went to school with her and she said, yes, it's my um, stepdaughter. So her and I became very close and her uncle was a priest. And I was out partying, doing my thing. And I just, I liked her, but she was too much of a holy roller for me. But one day she came over to my desk and she said to me, do you want to go to confession today? A holy day is coming up. And I'm like, is this girl out of her mind? Like, I'm going to go to confession with her. And I'm like out doing partying and all this. But I did not want to say no to her because I was so afraid. I don't know that she'd tell her uncle or someone in Staten Island would know that I was Catholic and I didn't want to go to confession. I had all these crazy things going on. So I went with her. And I walked in that confessional and I just said, bless me, Father, for I have sinned. And I just went hysterical crying and I confessed my abortion. And the priest was so kind and loving and he gave me absolution and he said to me, you come back and you talk to me. And I left there feeling, wow, can I really be forgiven for this? But just like that, I said, no, I can't be. God will never forgive me for this. And that's what the devil does. Abortion is his greatest accomplishment. And he gets in your head and says, you can't have that baby. How are you gonna have that baby? You're too young to have that baby. Your parents aren't gonna help you. Your boyfriend's not gonna let you help you. So you have that abortion. And then after you have that abortion, he gets right back in your head and says, you don't deserve to be forgiven. Look what you did and he plays with your mind. And the abortion, the devil loves abortion, hates healing. Well, Jim, wasn't that a very powerful uh, story she has? I mean, it, it's only an excerpt that we listen to now, but uh, it's really powerful to see um, where God has taken her in her life from this terrible experience. She's been able to find hope and healing, and now she actually works with women who have suffered the aftermath of an abortion and putting together Rachel Vineyard retreats. Uh, so it's just been a really touching story. No, you're, you're exactly right, Jennifer. I think that uh, when we hear those stories and put a face to these issues, uh, they kind of take a deeper impact on our lives. And uh, you know, I've seen it countless times, uh, not just with this issue, but with other issues where when you talk in the theoretical or just in the policy, uh, it's very easy to uh, not uh, to vilify or to think that this is the right action. But once you add that human element, once you put that face to what you're talking about, and not just a face, but a specific face, uh, I've seen uh, people's perspectives change. Uh, I, you know, on another unrelated issue, again, I've seen it uh, uh, many times when it comes to certain poverty issues, uh, you know, people, I know one individual who is very, um, I don't want to say anti-poverty, but was against certain uh, legislative actions. And they got to know people living in poverty. They came across a couple with young children and they got to know that couple with young children and it put a face to poverty for that person. And I won't say they changed all of their views, but it certainly softened and uh, softened them and opened their heart to uh, being less, I guess, forceful on what they currently held. So I think these stories that we hear, especially in this issue of the right to life issue is extremely important. So, you know, I'm always uh, uh, taken a, aback and given that deepness when you see the 3D ultrasounds. Uh, you know, I even recall uh, years ago working with a, a, a woman, uh, a co-worker, and she was pregnant with her first child, and 
prior to that pregnancy, her and I had many conversations on the right to life, and she was adamant that she was, you know, pro-abortion. And she went to her first ultrasound, and they did a 3D ultrasound. She came back, and she was showing the pictures. And I asked her, I said, did this change anything in terms of your view on abortion? And she said, yeah, it did. I saw that face of my child and how the child was moving around and reacting and, you know, even smiling, she said. And I, I, I'm completely blown away. And I, I've, I've seen her in recent years and she hasn't changed that. She has another, she has two children now and she, uh, you know, keeps talking about how, you know, they were people in the womb, yeah. you know, she would talk to them, she would, you know, and even my own wife, and uh, I'm sure, Jeffrey, you have your own experiences, my own wife played music, talked, you know, we, and you got, you got a reaction, so yeah, they, all of this, hearing Cheryl's story, hearing these other stories, seeing these uh, videos, it's, it's extremely important, because it, it brings a human face to this issue, and it's not just, you know, a, a policy that we're talking about, so extremely, extremely powerful. Absolutely. And I just want to reemphasize the need to always talk about the hope and healing that's there. Um, I know earlier you talked about this being a really emotional issue and, you know, you get people on either side being very emotional, basically based on their own, you know, their own personal experience, life experiences. Um, we always need to bring this message of hope and healing back to the conversation whenever we talk about the abortion issue, because you don't know what you, the person you're talking to has gone through. You could be speaking to a legislature, a legislator who's had an abortion experience in their life and yep. for that reason is very passionate about the issue. So we always want to bring our compassion, hope and healing to the conversation because that's what, that's what we're all about as a church. And so, again, in any format that you have, you always want to bring this message or end with this message that if you have suffered after an abortion or if someone that you know has suffered after an abortion, or you may not even relate it to the abortion, but you might be having a drinking problem or relationship problems or, or holding a job. You can't hold a job. Any kind of thing like that may go back to an abortion experience and some of the symptoms that, that occur with post-abortion syndrome. So um, just yeah. such an essential piece to always bring into the conversation. No, I, I think that's right. Um, I was thinking of a conversation I had with uh, one of my spiritual advisors when I was uh, in college. And... You know, I was talking about an issue very passionately and saying how how, how come we're not more forceful and uh, out there um, shouting about this. And he asked me, how many times did Christ overturn the tables in the temple and compared to how many times did he sit down and have a meal with the sinners? And if you look at the Gospels, he overturned the tables once and right. you know, chased the, uh, the money collectors out of the, the temple once. But there's a whole handful of stories that are of him sitting down with the sinner and having a meal with them and talking with them. So, you know, that really put that per into perspective about, about how we, uh, as Catholics, uh, approach our ministry, our evangelization, you know, uh, when dealing with people. And you're absolutely right. We don't know what anyone's going through. Um, again, it reminded me of another story of uh, speaking with someone about this right to life issue. And while this individual did not have an abortion, it did bring up uh, a previous traumatic experience of a sexual assault. And that's where she was at, you know, so she didn't have the abortion, but be, being a, a survivor of sexual assault, uh, you know, she held on to this view because that was a very traumatic experience for her. And that was something that this related to, to her. So again, if you're forceful and if you're not careful with your words, you're not charitable with your words, you don't know what the person's going through. And as Pope Francis says, we're a field hospital. We're here to go out and extend Christ's mercy to all. And so, you know, it's kind of, you know, we want to win this. We want to, we want to overcome this, but we have to ask ourselves at what cost, you know, at the cost of individual souls and bringing the mercy and love of Christ to every individual we meet, you know? So, you know, I don't think any of us would agree with that. You know? Yes. But. Always compassion, compassion, compassion. Right. Well, thank you, Jim. Thank you so much. Um, we're coming to the end. We just want to point you back to our, our website where we're hoping to have a clearinghouse of information as we develop materials they'll be available on this website and and uh, we'll be able to get them out distribute them widely to our state and um, thank you so much for all your help with this Jim and working with you thank you Jennifer for your help and your expertise you truly are an asset to the church here in New Jersey you and all the respect life directors the bishops I mean it's uh, you know we have a good team and it's been a pleasure working with you and I look
forward to continue uh, in our ongoing collaboration with this. And thank you for having me today. This was uh, truly a pleasure to be a part of and an honor. Thank you. Thank you, Jim.